Throughout most of its 200 plus years of existence, the United States has struggled with the idea of colonialism and empire. In 1898, the United States and Spain went to war, and as a result, the U.S. acquired the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Operating a nominal empire was a hotly debated topic within the U.S. The great questions of what are we going to do with these territories and do they have a right to self-determination would be prevalent. It seemed that for the most part the U.S. was not interested in colonization or any economic empires that would require the occupation of these territories. Part of this was likely economic. Manifest Destiny, the idea that the U.S. was destined to span from Atlantic to Pacific coast, had been realized, and surely this expansion would provide more than enough resources and economic opportunities that an external colonial empire wouldn't be required. Part of this was also likely political. The U.S. had for some time considered itself a bulwark of democracy, freedom, self-determination, and liberal economics, and it promoted these ideas particularly in the Western Hemisphere. These ideas were simply seen as incompatible with colonialism and empire. Yet, over time, the U.S. would develop a completely different type of interaction with its neighbors in the Western Hemisphere. This interaction, particularly when viewed from the outside in, has been called neocolonialism. Neocolonialism is more or less simple economic dominance, where actual physical occupation of a territory is typically unnecessary. The primary requirement of neocolonialism is a friendly government along with some resource to be exploited. Take, for example, the case of Honduras. In 1911, two U.S. companies vied for agricultural production in the state of Honduras, particularly the production of bananas. The United Fruit Company was favored by the Honduran government under President Miguel de Villa. The Cayamel Banana Company, another U.S. company, staged a coup to topple the government of de Villa and installed another general in his place. The Cayamel Banana Company overnight became the favored U.S. agricultural company in Honduras. In Colombia in 1928, a series of strikes by workers for the United Fruit Company led to a crackdown by the Colombian government. The government sent its military in and killed up to 2,000 strikers. Officially, the Colombian government claimed that the strikers were communists, though the general in charge of the crackdown claimed that the massacre was intended to ward off a threatened U.S. invasion of Colombia. Critics in the Colombian government believed that the state was under direct orders of United Fruit Company. In 1954, once again, bananas would play a role in the destruction of a government. In Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman was democratically elected under the concept of land reform. Up until this time, 70% of the arable land in Guatemala was owned by 2% of the population. Most farms were simply too small to be profitable. Arbenz proposed government expropriation of large tracts of uncultivated arable land and redistribution to smaller farms. The government would pay the owners of these properties based on the tax value of the land. The United States, at the urging of United Fruit Company, now known as Chiquita, staged a CIA-sponsored coup toppling the government. A military dictatorship was installed that would last for decades. Chiquita would continue to own most of the banana production, the electrical grid, railroad system, and telecommunications in Guatemala. The CIA, under an operation known as PB History, attempted to extract or fabricate information from the ex-Arbenz government in order to prove Soviet involvement. The operation was a complete failure, and the actions and players of the Arbenz government appeared to be completely motivated by nationalism, democracy, and the idea of self-determination. The history of U.S. government or corporate involvement in the politics of the Western Hemisphere is lengthy. But the ideas of so-called neocolonialism didn't extend only to the Western Hemisphere, nor did it extend only to bananas. In 1952, the United Kingdom took the Iranian government to the International Court of Justice in The Hague to argue against Iranian nationalization of the country's oil industry. The United Kingdom lost its case, and another route was devised. British intelligence, along with American Central Intelligence, executed Operation Ajax in 1953, which toppled the democratically elected Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh, and a dictatorship, some with even fascist or pro-Nazi ties, was installed. As a result, 
American oil companies were allowed to extract oil from Iran, and Iranian democracy and self-determination was put on hold. Back in the Western Hemisphere in 1970, the CIA began working covertly to overthrow the presidency of Salvador Allende of Chile. International Telephone and Telegraph, or ITT, an American company, owned 70% of Chilean telecommunications. ITT took an active role in lobbying for U.S. involvement in Chile. Allende's social programs and nationalization programs were widespread, and it's difficult to say how much of a role the CIA played in demolishing the Chilean economy. However, in 1973, a CIA-sponsored military junta toppled Allende's government. This brutal dictatorship accused of many human rights violations would last until 1990. Neo-colonialism lost a great foe when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. The U.S. and its corporations would have great difficulty using Marxism as an excuse for covert actions or invasions. Yet, self-determination has been stymied both in the Western Hemisphere and in the Middle East for some time. Today, U.S. friendly dictatorships exist throughout the Arabian Peninsula, supplying much of America's energy needs while also funneling large sums of cash to U.S. oil companies. Common political theory holds that many of these dictatorships would collapse without U.S. military support. In the U.S., some of us have a tendency to praise the invention of the everlasting, eternal, and immortal corporation and cast a blind eye toward corporate manipulation of our own government. The corporation seems to have an almost religious following, yet in some ways the U.S. could be seen as a puppet of corporate interests. In ways, it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. Do not arise the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you'll keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Just look at the giant head. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain.